we hear after this toe incident, we hear about Beverly. They talk about how he meets her on the beach playing beach volleyball and how she's like cheering on the, and how they play beach volleyball together and they make a great team. But when it comes to their relationship, we see that Rick is not great at being in that partnership. Right. Yep. Because of where he's at in his life at that time. Well, and you know, it's, I think the, the story of the toe, the toenail and how he chose to disconnect. It seems like the, the theme through most of the rest of the book is he is in fact disconnected. He's disconnected from his life. He's disconnected mm -hmm. from people in his life. He's disconnected from his experiences in his life. He is literally just showing up. And so to that end with Beverly, you know, he's, he, he, he's very fond of her, you know, from, from yeah. what it says, but at the same time, he's just not able to uh, fully connect with her, or recognize, I think, her value in that time, instead choosing to hang with, what was it, the Steves? Yeah, yeah. the Steves. Who are not Steves. And at, but... the, at the beer bars yeah. of Southern California, mm -hmm. LA. Yeah. <laughs> I like how they talk, how they get kicked out of, like, one by one by one, they're not allowed back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this well, isn't a, this isn't a tragedy though. It starts as a tragedy, but there is a shift because his angel, his sister, shows up, mm -hmm. and he knows Rick does as he's sitting at the poop deck, which is a bar in the book, and she shows up and he goes, "Okay, this is it." When I love the point that Dave Oliver makes in writing it and saying, if I let my sister leave, no one else is coming for me. Yes. So rock bottom, he realizes it and he's able to make a change, which I think is the greatest takeaway of this book is that no matter where you're at, no matter what your beliefs, your experiences are, your past, you can be in control and you can change all of that and you can just shift your perspective and become a brand new person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like you talk about Sierra and radical mindfulness, how your past is not your present and it's absolutely not your future. Which is Sierra's online course available for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's a very conscious shift. So what they don't tell us is they don't exactly tell us what the catalyst is for his sister's name is Mary. Um, they ju we just know that they haven't spoken in years. Both of the parents are dead that Mary has not spoken to Rick in, I think they say seven or eight years. And she shows up, she, she's talked to all these people to try to find out where to find him because he's homeless at this point, or actually he lives in uh, underneath uh, number nine, lifeguard stand number nine. And then we don't know why, but she comes in and she, this is, I love how the bartender says, he knows a rescue when he sees one, right? She comes in and she basically is calling him on all of his shit. What are you doing? What are you doing with your life? And it's very much like a, a come to Jesus. And she's like, come with me. And they talk about how Rick is staring at this pitcher of beer. And it's almost like he's been waiting for this to happen. He's needed this to happen. And he says, Mary is the last person who cares about him enough to do this. And he can sense that if he doesn't leave with her, she's never coming back. It's like that, that white horse that he's wanted to come in and, and, and save him from this cycle that he's been stuck in. Well, and to that end though, Mary was in that same cycle before. She, mm -hmm. They talk about that, how Mary was in that, you know, pit of despair and drowning in her sorrows with alcohol. And so it's interesting, you know, I, it, being a short book, we don't get into Mary's past at all, but I wonder who showed up to Mary at the bar and who gave her the, that's it, if anyone, or how Mary went to that transition. And so I'm curious, you know, because she went through it, she can understand. And so I think that's why she was, you know, she had gone through her transition her transformative mm -hmm. journey right and so then she 
you know, felt, I think in some ways being the older sister as well, felt a little bit of an obligation to help Rick out because they both were on a similar path. Mm -hmm. I, I, you're right. Mary got sober first. So Mary's been sober. And then when it comes time for the, um, you know, we were, why does she at this choose this time to help Rick? I actually think that perhaps she met Gigi and it was her, also her father coming through to the other side and saying, you know, it's time to help your brother. So mm -hmm. I wonder if it was just sort of like the passing along of that same path. Yeah. Yeah. Gigi was interesting. That whole conversation was very interesting. It was very um, short, like short, short, short conversation mm -hmm. in the words that were said. There was no, there wasn't a lot of like layers to that conversation in that regard. There was a lot of, of layers to the imagery to what was happening, right? But the the language was very short. It was it was like, this is, you know, I can't even remember exactly what was all going on, but it was just like, okay, here is this, here is this, here is that, go. <laughs> you know, it's just like... That's what we call effective communication, <laughs> right to the yeah. point, no dilly-dallying, no wasted yeah. time, let's just get in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, it was like, and all right, get out, go. <laughs> But there's a lot of what's not actually written that's being yeah. said. Yeah, and Rob, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. They go into detail about as he's he's riding his bicycle to her house. Uh, it's going to Gigi's house. And he's taking all these things in and he sees about seeing these butterflies, right? He uh, Is it the butterflies? Hummingbirds. The hummingbirds. Yeah. And he says they're communicating together in their own way. And he's very aware of like all these details. And then when you're in the conversation, because his sister hasn't told him what's going on. She's like, go there. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine the scenarios that might be running through your head if you're Rick on that bike ride? Like, anyway. They trust her enough to do it. Yeah. Well, because yeah. she's trusted in him. She's, you know, she's given him a place, a refuge. She's investing in him. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So as they're having this conversation, there's so much that if you just imagine, there's so much that's being said without using words. And Rob, I know this is probably like, was I was reading it going, this is Rob's juicy section right here. <laughs> they even say communication is like super important, right? In the book. So I was like, good job, Dave Oliver. You nailed it. Because it is such an important concept from a listening standpoint being open-minded as a standpoint. I'll give you an example. I went to a, a, a rally the other day. And at this rally, my co-host on the radio, Mike Russell, was giving a speech. So I wanted to go hear him speak. And I'm standing there at this rally, and I see a man. He's holding a Confederate flag. Do you have a judgment right now? <laughs> Because you automatically think something. But he was a black man. I've never seen that before. So I needed to find out. So I went over and I communicated with him. I said, hi, I'm Rob. He said, hi, I'm Al. I said, hey, Al, I'm just curious of the obvious question. And I didn't know what his answer was going to be, but I wasn't judging his answer. I was genuinely curious. So he told me. It's like, Number one, I'm an individual. I don't buy into the symbol that this is for everybody else. For me, it's my family's heritage. And I thought that was very interesting because I've never had a conversation like that before. Right. So instead of standing there just saying, wow, that's interesting. I'm like, it is interesting. Interesting enough to go have a conversation about. And we had a nice, probably five to seven minute conversation okay. about his heritage and about why he's carrying this flag and what it me meant to him and you know, the, the idea of being an individual and not going into groupthink necessarily because he has a different opinion. And he was bold enough to stand there and display his opinion. Wow. So because it was sort of like that conversation, right? It wasn't quite as direct or short, but it was me taking my judgments out of the way and saying, let's have, let's have a conversation about this. Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting too, even I just happened to pull to that page 
you know, when they first start talking and, you know, what business are you in communication? Okay, let's start communicating. She's like, oh no, not me, you. And then she yeah. says, you've been communicating since you walked onto my property, basically. Uh-huh. And that's a really, that's a key thing to remember. I think you even talk about well, that. Al was definitely communicating. Right? Yes. Without you know, speaking. Yes. We communicate in many different ways that are beyond the words that are coming out of our mouth. What we wear, you know, how we dress, uh, you know, maybe how, you know, how, how our hair, our facial expressions, whatever it is. We are communicating in numerous ways that are not verbal. Great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and this woman, although they never actually give a label to what she is, she's definitely has some psychic ability here, but they they don't give her a label like she is a X, Y, Z. But she's obviously used to reading signs and reading in, but in a way of helping. And I love the permission that she asks. She asks him, what's keeping you stuck? Now, mind you, she asks, and if I know what I know from what I read about her character, she's probably psychic and, or, or a medium and already knows. She asks more for him to answer than for her to hear. Yeah, it's more, I love, oh, go ahead, yeah. It's more like she needs him to open that box, right? Yeah, like she even asked him, you know, she's asking him a bunch of questions. um, And she says, you know, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Well, do you want to be better than okay? And, you know, don't, better than all right, better than just, you know, hanging in there. Don't you, do you want something more than that? And it wasn't a don't you want, it was, it was a sincere question do you want which i think is just that subtle change you know when we say well don't you want this we're passing our judgment on to that person and all of us are guilty of it i mean myself probably primarily everyone primarily but it's it's coming at it more from a natural curiosity than intending to influence you know even though she is influencing well she's she's asking he's allowing him to determine what happens Mm -hmm. and she's also allowing him to have his own experience with this yeah which is very hard to do as both a leader and a teammate in lots of different scenarios of what that means it's you want to be there enough to help but you can't make somebody fix their own problem right You have to be willing to hand somebody back their own problem, maybe with some tools. In this case, the tool she gives him is called automatic writing. But she's handing it back to him saying, okay, you've said that something's making you stuck. What was making him feel stuck? His father, the relationship, the experience that he had with his father. Now, I believe Gigi already knew this, but she needed him to say it because now he's owning it. Now it's his problem again. And now she's telling him, you know, they're both here with you. They're, you know, and, and this is what you do. This is how you communicate with him, with her. And she, it's the simplest thing. She says, literally just get a pad of paper and a pen and they're ready. Like they're ready to talk to you, just write things down. So she's now giving him the tool and told him this is, they they don't even say if they ever meet again. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's her entire role in Rick's life. Or try something new. And and I think that Rick receiving that is important as well. Because oftentimes we close off what might be considered a challenge to where we're at because we have a natural defense mechanism. Our survival instincts kick in, which also Sierra talks a ton about in her course, radical mindfulness. It's automatic. It's subconscious. It's every species innate ability or innate need to try to survive, to try to keep the species alive. So in the modern context, it's not, do I want to eat that berry off that tree or not? Is it going to kill me? Oh, what's that big animal doing over there? It's more of a mental survival tactic of comfort because those challenges don't come in the form of man versus nature. 
it's more man versus man, man versus himself, or woman versus herself, if I could be so bold mm -hmm. as to be diverse, mm -hmm. which I loved. I mean, I, I love that idea of, of he gets to this point because he levels up, right? And he, and he proves to himself that he can do it. He can stop drinking. So now, once you've proved yourself one thing, which all of us have done, Sierra, you've proved something to yourself before. Amy, you've proved something to yourself before. I've done it. Once you prove something to yourself, there's really nothing you can't do. Mm -hmm. And I said this to a friend yesterday. Take the limits off yourself. Mm -hmm. Dream big. Because whoever you admire, whoever you look up to and you say, you know, that Steve Jobs was brilliant. Well, why can't you be the next Steve Jobs or the next big version of you to be even more specific? which is exactly what Rick's journey now is going to become the way I see it. Once he says, okay, stop drinking. I know what my major barrier is. It's my father because he ripped my toenail off and was a drunk and abusive. Now I'm going to make an attempt to move past that because it is in the past. And I've come to this realization. The past is not real. It's only real in your head. Mm -hmm. And that, that is an important revelation for me because now it makes it easier to move on past your past, if that makes sense. Yes, it is. But yeah, it, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and he, he takes this so beautifully. So at this point, the, the ending of the story is he gets home, he takes, and Mary's not there. I think this is by design. And he takes out a pad of paper and a pen, full stop. Thanks. And then realize, yes. And that's when we realize that the other narration in there is what he has written down through this automatic writing, his way of connecting with his father and repairing this. I, I like the way that it ends because the future now is in Rick's hands. It's possibilities. Yes. Right. So the, it, it sort of ends in that perfect place of, you know, once he takes this step and sheds his skin, so to speak, he's a brand new man. And he can accomplish, going back to what you just said, Sierra, whatever he wants to accomplish, because he's always held himself back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the limits. Take off the limits. <laughs> 